All right, so if I was still a cross country runner, these are the five ATG exercises I would focus on. As for a little bit of credentials, I ran cross country for two years in high school and then two years in community college. I'd say my best ever all around time event was 2505 for eight kilometers, which is just a hair under five miles. If I was a cross country runner and I wanted to implement some ATG principles into my training on top of my running schedule. These are gonna help you have quicker feet, more resilience against injury, because you're gonna be running all those dozens and dozens of miles every single week, as well as race time. This is gonna help you with power and overall strength. One of the biggest things I've seen lacking in cross country runners is that strength, especially towards the end of a race. The whole body is getting fatigued from head to toe. It's often the runner that can stay strongest, longest in the race, the one that wins. Of course, we're all working on our aerobic engines. And if you're in cross country, likely your aerobic engine is already phenomenal, but your body might be lacking a little bit behind. So let's get into it. The very first exercise, and this might not come as a surprise, is the ATG split squat. Now I'm gonna walk you through the form as well as where I believe you as a cross country runner should start. So this is perfect flat ground form with no weight. You're keeping this back knee elevated off the ground. You're keeping your torso upright. You have full hamstring and calf coverage and you're allowing your heel to lift up if it needs to. If you have better ankle mobility than me, then it might stay flat. Now, you can regress this by using elevation like this. And if you're an athlete, you might need a lot less than this. This is really highly dependent on how opened up your hips are. Again, trying to keep that back knee off the ground, upright torso, you shouldn't be doing things like this to compensate for your hip. Upright torso, full hamstring and calf coverage. What that allows is your knee to fully flex to get that absolute full range. As a cross country runner, for many athletes in general, you're getting a lot of short range action while you're running. Your knee is only ever really extending about this much in running. Right? So this is allowing that full knee bend that you don't get really in any sports and it's going to allow for adaptation in that knee that we need to get stronger and more resilient. Assuming as cross country runners we're not the strongest people, you want to start this with absolutely no weight or even assistance from a wall or a PVC pipe if you need it. Implement this once or twice a week, it'll open up your hip length, it'll create adaptations in the knee, and once you really get that form down all the way to flat ground, then you can consider adding weight. The next exercise is somewhat working the opposite of what we just did with the split squat, and that is gonna be hip flexor raises. Now, there are many ways in which you can do this. You can use a monkey foot, attach some sort of weight to your foot and do single-legged stuff. This is what I'm gonna demonstrate because it works, it gets the job done, and likely you can find somewhere to hang from. So, what this is doing is teaching your body or strengthening your body to pick up your legs faster. If you think about it, running, half of the motion is picking your leg back up to do the next motion. So if we're stronger and more resilient in this motion, it's naturally gonna make us faster and more powerful when we run. Sprinters have some of the biggest and strongest hip flexors. Now, I'm not saying we need that level of strength and size when it comes to distance running, but it will help you a lot. So what you're gonna do, and you can add weight to this if you want. Some of you may already be very strong in this, but you'll dead hang like this. Ideally get a bar that's high enough where you can dead hang pretty freely. You're gonna keep your feet slightly in front of you. That way you're not just like completely disengaging the abs and the hip flexors. Slightly in front of you, and then control your lift, and then lower back down. You can vary this by also just stopping halfway. This is a bit more challenging to stop at 90 degrees. You can also extend your legs and lower it down. All of these are gonna help drive more power into that short range of your hip flexor. Now this is going to tighten your hip flexors even more. And if you're a student or whatever, you're probably sitting a lot already. So you really need to pair this with the ATG split squat to get both strength and length in those hip flexors. Next up is actually a upper body movement. This is a cross bench pullover. Now before I get into this one, as cross country runners, we tend to not have much strength or mass in the upper body. 
and that's totally fine on the math side. You do want to have some strength and resilience because if you think about it, just because your legs are doing all the working doesn't mean the upper body isn't involved. Often, if you have better posture in the upper body and more strength, you're going to be more resilient and it's also just going to lead to better biomechanics, better breathing, better posture, and it's all going to feed into itself to be a better runner. If you can choose between being a runner that moves as smoothly as, let's say, I don't know, Jakob and Gabrickson, as opposed to, I forget his name, because that Colombian runner, great runner, of course, but he's got no neck, his arms are all tight in here, you're probably going to choose the smoother form, and that's just intuitively what we see, and it happens to be true that smoother upper body mechanics is going to lead to better outcomes as a runner. So with that said, there are other upper body movements that are gonna help full range dips, full range chin-ups, but I'm only gonna focus on this one because I think this one might have the most benefit for runners, especially like in the last exercise, if you are sitting all the time and you have those rounded shoulders like I am still working on. So with the cross bench pullover, you're gonna take away, this is 10 kilos. I would recommend starting with five maximum if this is your first time. You're going to be cross to the bench. You're going to put your mid upper back ish area on the bench. And you're going to take your weight. You can do this with dumbbells as well. Lift it overhead. Keep your hips down and extend back. You can sink into this and sort of just relax. You can rep it out in the long range or you can do full reps. There it is. So you notice my hips are down. Arms fully back. You can play around with this. It's really going to help with your posture. And like I said before, it all carries over. Better posture, better, better breathing, better biomechanics, better overall health. You may as well fix your posture if you're going to take your running seriously. Next up is the tibialis raise. This is a tib machine, but I will show you how to do it on the wall. Briefly, I'm gonna explain why, not only should, but you basically need to be training this if you want to avoid shin splints. Most of us, whether we're runners or not, have heard of the calf raise exercise. It's very common in PE class, and in almost every sport, you will see some form of calf raise being done. Me on my cross country team, that was one of the few body weight exercises we did to strengthen the body. In retrospect, although it is valuable, is nowhere near as valuable as the tibialis raise. There are of course many muscles that make this lower leg work, but if you think of it in the most simple terms, you have two movements for the ankle. You can extend your ankle, and I know the science people will say that it's got a different term, who cares? You can extend your ankle and you can flex your ankle. When we're running, we're doing a lot of extension. With every step, extend, push, push, extend, extend, extend. That's fine, we need to be strong in that extension. But most of us already are, especially if you've been running for a while, right? But we are not strong in this, the flexion. So how you can do it against the wall, for a pole in this case, put your butt, your hips against the wall, and just flex your toes up. Now it's not as good as a machine, but do this for 20, 30 reps until you feel burned. You can put your feet further out to make it more difficult. This is going to be phenomenal if you've dealt with shin splints before because you're going to be strengthening that front portion of the lower leg, which so many runners have a lot of chronic issues with, myself included. That along with hamstring issues were some of the worst I had. So get your tip raises in. Thank me later. The last exercise I'm going to be showing you is the KOT calf raise. You could also call it a bent knee calf raise, a soleus calf raise. What it is, is basically any form of calf raise where your knees are bent. Now real quick, when your knees are bent, it's gonna be working a very different muscle than when your knees are straightened out. So when you're straightened out like this, you're gonna be working more so, I believe it's called the gastrocnemius. It's this higher, meatier, fattier portion of the calf. That's a great thing to work, for sure. But as runners, like with the tibialis raise, we're often lacking, not so much lacking, but weak through the Achilles. Almost every runner has either experienced it or personally knows a runner who has had Achilles pain. I never had it growing up, thankfully, but I know many people that have. So what we can do to target this Achilles is actually two different things. Now, I don't think this is talked about too much within the actual ATG system, but I think 
it is very important to make a distinction between these two forms of the exercise. Now you can also do this with a seated cap machine if you have access to that, but the same principle applies. Now, you're going to put your hands up against the wall, you're going to bend your knees until your ankles won't allow any more, and you're going to go forward a little bit more. Now here, we have a deep stretch through the soleus, that's the bottom portion of your calf, as well as the Achilles, because the soleus attaches to the Achilles, which attaches to the heel. Now here we are in a stretch position. From here, we can rep out our calf raises, no problem at all, right? And this is great if you're not in Achilles pain, very specific here, if you're not in Achilles pain, this is fantastic. The distinction I wanted to make is that there is a long range form of this exercise and a short range form. Now, if you're in Achilles pain currently, you should not, in my opinion, be stretching that Achilles like I was just doing, or at least not very much. If you are gonna do it, you need to regress it a lot. What you can do to help with the healing of that Achilles is work a short range movement. Now, this isn't the best example, although I could use a dumbbell for weight. Now, if you'll notice here, my knee is still bent, right? So that's gonna target, right now when I calf raise, that is gonna be targeting the soleus and therefore the Achilles. However, what you will notice compared to that movement is that the Achilles is not under stretch here. We have a lot more range to bring my knee forward before I have an Achilles stretch. So what this does for us is that we can work a short range position of the soleus raise that is not gonna put a stretch on the Achilles but it is still gonna work the Achilles and work the soleus, bringing blood flow in, but not causing further damage, like I said, if you are in pain. So you do this with a seated calf machine, although I would just be careful to not stretch at the bottom if you wanna work this short range. And you can just pump right here. This is extremely light. You're gonna to wanna to put like 20 or 30 kilos, if that's what you can handle. If not, maybe older people, we just wanna do body weight. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that this is better or worse than the stretched version that I just showed you, but it is different. If you are in pain, it is much more beneficial in the short term to work the short range position. This goes for your Achilles, this goes for your knee, this goes for your shoulder, elbow, whatever it is, until you get enough blood flow and enough healing to the area where you can return to longer range to create that adaptation. All right, so hopefully if you're a cross country runner, hopefully those tips worked. There are many, many, many other exercises that I can cover in the future. Things like the pigeon stretch, the couch stretch, sledding of course, which some of you may be asking why I didn't bring that up. I just think sledding of course gives you that cardio benefit. And I understand that there is the short range benefit as well. So if you are in knee pain, which personally I never experienced knee pain while being a cross country runner, it's more so the hips and the ankles in my experience in knowing other cross country runners. But if you do want to do some sledding, definitely give that a try. Again, there are many, many others for the upper body. There's upper body pulling like chin ups, there's the dips, there's Nordics are huge, huge, huge hamstring curls, either with a machine or a free weight. So there's a lot more. These five are by no means like the perfect five, but if you're new to ATG training, you don't know anything about ATG training, give these five a try and you can definitely see some results. Drop any comments below if you have any questions about other ATG training. I am a L2 certified ATG coach with four years of running experience. I stopped running, I wanna say three years ago. Competitively, I stopped five years ago and I stopped running basically altogether about three years ago to pursue goals in strength training. But hopefully that helps and see you in the next video.